Welcome everybody to Rapture Prep Podcast. So today, joining with me, my co-host, the numbers guy, Eric. What's up, Eric? Hey, what's going on, man? Well, it's numbers, we're going to talk about the, the, the number of rounds you can fit in your magazine, right? All right. So today, as he just called it, we're going to be talking about guns and ammunition. So um, we're going to be talking about how Jesus told us that we should get strapped with some weapons. Okay. Yes, it's in the Bible. So um, I know Eric's going to, he's chomping at the bit here to discuss Mm -hmm. that. So we need to open up with the scripture that says that Jesus said that we should get strapped. So um, without further ado, Eric, you're going to have to open us up here with the word of God. All right, so if we turn our Bibles or your cell phones or your Google fingers to Luke twenty two thirty five, we'll start there. Uh, we we'll use right. the, use the NIV version, you know, because we like to use the watered down version of the Bible, right? So no, I'm just kidding. All right. So it, yeah, so it says what we want it to say. Yeah, okay, I'm here. Oh, right. right, we could use King James. All right, but so. <laughs> Then Jesus asked them, uh, when I sent you without purse, bag, or sandals, did you lack anything? Nothing, they answered. He said to them, but now if you have a purse, take it, and also a bag. And if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. It is written, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and I tell you that this must be fulfilled in me. Yes, what is written about me is reaching its fulfillment. The disciples said, see, Lord, here are two swords. That's enough, he replied. All right, so this is in Luke chapter 22, and you read verses uh, 30... 35 through 38, I believe. Is what 35 through 38, okay. Yeah, so in context here, Jesus is talking about a few different things, and um, but he's preparing them to uh, walk with him and and helping them to get ready but right here clear as day he says um you know do you have a sword if not sell your cloak and buy one so now he came back with and he had they had two swords okay so you can see here that even though jesus was walking with the disciples he wanted them to have weapons he actually told them to go and get weapons so eric what's your take on that I mean, I think uh, Jesus was a man's man in a lot of ways, you know. Uh, now, you see, Jesus came here the first time passively, and he came to extend love and to show love and everything. But at the same time, Jesus is a warrior king. We we, we see uh, in the battle where Joshua was going into battle, and I heard this at church last week, that all of a sudden he saw this man with a sword, right? Which we believe was an old Testament appearance of Jesus. And he asked him, whose side are you on? And he said, I'm not on either side. And he said, I'm the commander of the Lord's army. And he said, well, what does my Lord have to say to me? Right. And then you see in revelation, which we've used this scripture before on the podcast, 1911, uh, where it says, um, Jesus is coming on a white horse and his name is, faithful and true and if you read further down he has a sword coming out of his mouth right and he's coming back in this situation to slay the enemies of god so you know a lot of people think of jesus as a pacifist and i'm sorry to shadow shatter your view of jesus but he wasn't a pacifist what jesus did was no greater man love has any man than this that he laid down his life for his friends so jesus came and he laid down his life for us right willingly But at the same time, he's telling his disciples, hey, it's so important that you have a sword that if you don't have one, sell your cloak, sell your clothes and go get a go get a sword, you know? Okay, so, you know, their cloak, they would use that for, you know, weather conditions, right? Right. So, you know, he's basically saying for survival, I would prefer you have a weapon, you know, or weapons accessible, right? than, you know, to personally have a cloak, right? Right. Um, But it's good to be prepped to where you have both, right? 
Now, yep. there's some Christians out there that are going to say, okay, well, I didn't know that was in the Bible, but, you know, when it comes to using a sword, what did Peter do, and what was the scenario there? Yeah, and so obviously we see that Peter, uh, which, I mean, obviously the Lord didn't rebuke him for having a sword, because he's running around with one here, but Peter, whenever they came to seize Jesus, pulled out his sword and chopped the guy's ear off, and Jesus healed the man's ear right and rebuked peter saying those who live by the sword will die by the sword so there almost can seems to be okay all right so yeah that's uh that's a good that's a good point you know they contradict each other or you know or do they you know uh looking into this a little bit further um for their journey he was saying hey let's take a couple of swords right out of what the 12 he said two is fine right so um but when it come when it came to peter and the disciples right they had this theory that jesus was come coming the messiah to save them from the oppression of the romans Mm -hmm. and they liked this uh this theory or this thought of the kingdom of god on earth you know as it is in heaven okay good we're gonna set up and rule and reign and then what the sons of thunder are like oh well jesus who's gonna be on your left and your right hand you know on the the throne here like i want to be in charge right Mm -hmm. and they were thinking about military positions right then that like in the near future right they weren't thinking like what jesus was thinking about so they were looking more of a you know a militia situation right starting an army and um jesus wasn't thinking like that so um when peter right came to jesus's defense jesus had been told telling him the whole time hey look I'm, you know, the son of man is going to be taken away like Jonah, you know, in the belly of the earth for three days. Right. Um, and so they didn't really understand what was going on. So Peter tried to stop the will of God by happening. Jesus being seized. Right. And in, and in doing so, that's when Jesus rebuked him. Right. 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 So we see that Jesus is saying, look, having weapons, you know, for your everyday purpose, things of that nature, protections, fine, but don't use them to stop the will of God, especially the Son of Man, who was slain before the foundations of the earth, Isaiah says, to, you know, to stop the will of God from happening. So there's the, there's the contradiction there. I mean, can you think of anywhere else where there would be a contradiction in the New New Testament? I mean, there's plenty of verses that seem to contradict one another, but just like what we did here, once you dive down a little bit further, you find that they didn't, they don't contradict one another. Like, I think, uh, I may not be able to pull this up perfectly, but there's an example with uh, the death of Judas, right? And I think one of uh, them, they're described two different ways. His death is described two different ways. I can't remember the exact, um, you might be able to pull this up, but I can't remember the exact way but it's described two different ways and our pastor explained that it's called the law of non-contradiction so for example i could say like judas died in a car wreck right and then you could write down and say uh judas's head was bashed right well those two things don't necessarily contradict each other right because maybe judas died in a car wreck and as a result of the car wreck his head was bashed but the two different writers explained it in two different ways. And so a lot of the time when people are looking at scripture, they'll say, Oh, look, that contradicts each other, but does it really contradict each other? You have to take into account the hermeneutics of it and the law of non-contradiction to get into a, a, um, you know, theological study. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And that's, and that's a good point, you know? And so I wanted to um, bring that, that scripture out in the light because um, I totally had forgot that Jesus was like, yo, get some swords, you know? Okay, y'all got a couple of them? That's all we're going to need. Let's go, you know? Um, and so trying to think about it, um, Jesus probably wanted to have for them to have swords for protection um, as a deterrent, maybe, right? 
But what he didn't want was for them to be a militia, a, 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 you know, a gang of outlaws, you know, someone that was bullying people, right? Um, that's why he talked about turning the other cheek, you know, loving, forgiving one another, right? But never did he say, if someone's trying to kill you, hold out your neck. Do you remember reading that? <laughs> no, never read that. Okay, 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 okay. So he's just talking about offenses. <laughs> he's talking about um things of that nature relationship wise right right okay so we can safely move forward um knowing that it's okay question here uh paul if jesus says uh two is sufficient does that mean that we need a rifle and a pistol or what's that so here we go (laughs) (laughs) uh the roller coaster has started. Put your arms and legs safely inside and put your seatbelt on. Um, so my theory is more of a zombie apocalypse style. Uh, have a ha- good hand, trusty handgun and a shotgun. Okay. Um, and I think you're more rifle pistol. Sorry. Oh, right, but I right. think shotguns are shotguns are wonderful. A great home defense weapon. I think you should have. Maybe should maybe the Bible should have said we have three, and he says sufficient. But no. But <laughs> you know. But. Uh, you know, no, but in all seriousness, I, all three are great. You know, I mean, they all serve different purposes. I just think that it's good to have something for a close distance confrontation. Shotgun is obviously excels in that uh, range. I mean, you don't, you know, we know with a shotgun, you don't have to be as good of an aim, you know, at, at close. Distance. I mean, you still need to aim. Some people think you could just point a shotgun nowhere and, and hit everything, but you still need to aim, but not as, as well, right? And, yeah. and, and even just the, and I, I'm sure you've experienced this, you know, uh, even just the click clack of the shotgun, you know, somebody's knocking at your door crazy and they hear, <laughs> I mean, that deterrent, you know. Well, it, hey, so what now? I gotta, I gotta stop you here. So the Bible says thou shalt not kill. So what does that mean? Well, I think the correct translation of it is thou shalt not murder. Mm. And there's a difference between killing and murdering. You know, if I'm killing in self-defense, yes, I'm stopping a heart, right? But I'm do I'm stopping a heart to keep other hearts beating, right? Hmm. And so if by me taking a life, I'm preserving the life of myself and preserving the life of others, right? Then I'm not murdering. It's like the guy here recently, uh, Elijah Dickens up in... Uh, indiana who stopped the mall shooter from 40 yards which is pretty darn impressive wait are you gonna try to try to uh say that jesus wants us to stop shooters now oh uh, yeah i think so absolutely okay. i think yeah um i can quote you on that <laughs> yeah yeah and if jesus says i'm wrong then i guess he can tell me but um right right but yeah i uh yeah, you look at the guy, Elijah Dickens, who stopped the mall shooter, right? How many people would have died if he hadn't done that? Wow. You're, you're, you're a man, right? And, you know, maybe you shouldn't be sitting out here defenseless, walking around like you're a, you know, I don't know, a crippled duck or something. You know, hmm. may, maybe you should have some sort of means to defend those around you, you know, and uh, maybe especially like the women and children, which I, I I recently heard a speech by John Lovell and he was talking about this and he was saying, Hey, look, as a man, as a godly man, it's your role to be there to defend your family and to defend. I mean, that's what men are called to do. Men, you know, we're called to lead, provide and protect, right? Like if you're doing, uh, you know, we're not necessarily now I'm going to say something that sounds sort of sexist. I'm not being sexist, but we're not necessarily called to uh, do the dishes and, uh, you know, cook the meals. I mean, although, hey, you could do that, too, as a man, I'm not saying you can't. But our primary role as men is to lead, provide and protect. Right. And so if you're doing those things, then you're fulfilling your obligation to your family. If one of those things is missing. So I'm not only saying that you it's okay for you to be willing to defend your family and have means to, I'm saying that you should, I'm saying that, I mean, Jesus basically gave them a commandment almost there. I don't know if we could call it a commandment, but it's almost a commandment. He said, Hey, uh, do you guys have any swords? They said, uh, 
you know, well, and he says, well, if you don't sell your shirt and go get, sell your coat and go get one. He said, well, we have two. Okay. That's cool. We'll go ahead and go on. But, you know, I think if they said, no, we don't have any swords, he would have said, well, you better go get one, you know, right now. And well, so yeah, it, it, it definitely was, he was given an order, you know, and so you don't want to disobey orders from Jesus. And like you said, um, someone that doesn't protect, take care of their family, the Bible says is worse than an infidel. And so we, we've got to protect our family, protect ourselves, protect one another. The law even um, makes uh, allowances for that. And uh, you're justified in doing that. So, um, <clears throat> you know, and I wanted to clarify that because growing up, we're taught thou shalt not kill, you know, and it's like, oh, okay, well, you know, now people are don't want to join the military. They don't want to protect our freedom. They don't want to be a police officer. They don't, you see what I'm saying? But what that actually means in but, the Hebrew is it means murder. And so I knew Eric meant, knew that. And so I want him to clarify because we shouldn't be trying to go take a life, you know, but if it, if it's trying to protect our own, that's different. So, um, you know, we but, see here. But, oh. but, but let's say, and I'll probably have some stuff to give some input on this too, but let's say that I'm a, uh, you know, uh, I'm going to set you up for this one here. Let's say I'm a single woman or something like that, right? Obviously I'm not, but you know, uh, for our listeners out there and let's say I'm like, okay, well, Jesus says I should go get a gun. Uh, where do you, where do you think a good place to start with that is? I mean, do you have a certain handguns that you think are good i mean i know you had an experience uh with your with your sister here recently maybe you could kind of walk us through that process right so um with me i remember i first um uh, i first in bible college i was like 18 i got it my one of my first jobs was in security and i started carrying a weapon soon after that uh as a job and on my person, you know, concealed handgun license, took the classes, all that. So, um, you know, I know that in the Bible it says, of course, take care of yourself, take care of others. It's biblical and you're a hero if you do that. And so um, hoping to never use it, of course, I went into that line of work for a uh, wow, decade or more. And so I've had a lot of training government training, uh, I've had secret government clearances, worked at a lot of government places, had different kinds of handgun training, OC baton, uh, handcuffing, just all sorts of qualifications. And so um, I fell short of being a police officer because God deterred me from that. And, but long story short, I was thinking, hey, I'm gonna go be a chaplain too. But God's like, no, calm down, you know, stay in your lane. Um, cause I, I got excited about the spiritual side and about the, you know, tactical side as well of life. And God's just like, stay in the middle, you know? And, um, so I've had a lot of training and just recently with all the shooters and things of this nature, my sister said, Hey, look, um, I'm, you know, I'm a teacher and I want to, I'm, I really want to get a gun and, and learn how to shoot it. So I said, well, hey, let me let me take it aside some time and show you. you hold, know. On, hold on, hold on. So you're telling me, I'm I'm shocked here for a second. You're telling me uh -oh. that your sister is a teacher and she's not a total libtard and she wants to make, she wants to defend kids and, and she cares about protecting Saving lives. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Jesus does say that he has, he's kind of fond of kids. So he wants you to protect them and keep them safe. So, yeah, as a Christian, she feels that it's her duty and obligation to uh, protect her classroom. She actually loves the kids that she teaches. Um, so, yes, I, I, I agree. And I think that teachers should have the option of having a weapon in their classroom and being able to learn how to use it. And so I have a fringe topic I want to ask you about here. So I think that gun laws in general are infringements, right? This is my view on them because the second amendment says the right to keep and bear arms by not be infringed. Now I doubt that your sister is probably going to carry at school because you know, she'd get in trouble. Right. Right. Um, but should you, 
break the law to defend yourself if you feel like you have the right, you know, or the quote unquote law, right? Because the highest law of the land is the Constitution. And so any law that goes against the Constitution is really an invalid law. That's kind of a whole nother ball of wax. But what do you think about that in general? Like, you know, uh, this guy that defended those people at the mall, you know, he actually carried his gun into a gun free zone. And in Indiana, that was a gun free zone. And yet he stopped the shooter. So some people say, well, he broke the rules. You know, what would you say about that? Uh, well, you can't uh, ignore the obvious. There are rules and there was a rule that was broken by a few people that day. Um, one of which is someone who brought a weapon in there with the intent to murder people. And did so. And then someone else who brought a weapon in there, but didn't intend to murder people, but to protect if necessary. So, um, as you've seen in the past, there's been situations that have occurred like that. And then the police station say, well, we're not going to press charges at this time. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, you know, without me even saying anything. If the law is going to break their own law, then why is it a law? Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And I think in Indiana, you can actually ignore. uh, So just to clarify for our listeners, you can ignore the gun free zone signs legally, even though the end. But if the business owner says, hey, you need to leave this place, you know. Uh, then you can't trespass. No. And, and, you know, I'll be, you know, I'll be honest. There's been times where I've gone places and I see a sign or something and it says, you're not supposed to carry here. And I go, okay, well, am I, am, am I going to listen to that or am I going to carry anyway? Because, you know, if something happens, you know, well, and so I'm not going to say which decision I've made because of, but anyway, I've, you know, at times it's like, you know, your, your life is important. That's all I'm going to say, you know, and you've got to make that on your own right yeah and we've both uh told each other stories of having to go back and put the gun in the car and be inconvenienced and then you know if someone's watching us read that sign and then go put our gun away and if they're seeing that we're unloading a gun somewhere you know it can get stolen and then now we've created an opportunity for a you know a criminal to go kill someone so i mean it's it's uh it's up in the air um, I would definitely say do what um, you think the Bible says to do. Okay, uh, should we obey? Should we obey God rather than man? Okay, well, what does God say to do when it comes to authorities? Okay, should we obey them? Should we not? You know, um, right. and so I'm going to tell you what I would always tell you: do what the Bible says. Okay, um, now we do have certain. Uh, responsibilities because you know in the future if the if the law of the land is hey uh you know stealing is right or you know um getting kids neutered or whatever is right right you know uh i mean all these things like should we do them you know uh should we take the mark of the beast because if we don't it's illegal and we're, they're gonna kill us no, in Acts it said we should obey God rather than man. So, um, not giving you any legal advice here, to be clear. Um, right, right. Do not. So, I wanted to segue. Let's segue back into this just for a second because I think we kind of skipped around a little bit here, and I'll kind of give my take on it. You can you can give uh, yours as well. So, if you're if you're someone out there and you haven't owned a weapon, or you're thinking maybe I need to go get a weapon. What practical steps do I think that you need to take, right? It's not as simple as, look, I'm just going to go buy a gun, and now congratulations, I've fulfilled my duty. And if you're in Texas, like we are here, you can actually do constitutional carry. So you don't even have to have a license or any training, which is a little bit scary. So Yeah, that's scary. What I would encourage you to do, right, number one, go find a, a pistol that's that you can carry that feels good you know in your hand etc right that you can get some practice with and some training with um i typically would encourage somebody that's getting a first time gun to get what i call a a duty 
level trigger. And what I mean by that is don't go find a gun that has the most easy to pull sensitive trigger in the world to where you could have a negligent discharge or it's easy to go off. You know, something like a Glock is like a really good starter gun because you notice like the reason that people carry Glocks and police departments carry Glocks is that the triggers on the Glock, they're not too hard to pull, but they require enough pressure that you're not going to really unintentionally pull the trigger. Right. And uh, so, and they're also very reliable. You want to look for a gun that's, that's reliable. I would say, secondly, you want to make sure that you get a good quality holster. Now you can just decide whether you're going to carry concealed or you're going to open carry, depending on where you're at and the laws and your comfort level and all of that. Uh, Paul and I have some different views on that, but we'll get into that on this, uh, on this podcast. Um, but the next thing I would really encourage you to do is go sign up for some like basic pistol uh, classes, right? Learn how to use the weapon efficiently, you know, learn how to, you know, shoot a tight group at, you know, seven to 10 yards, learn how to draw a pistol effectively, you know, all of these mechanics that you can go through. Um, one of the places I've got some good classes from is the, the Warrior Poet Society out there. You can get classes online, but even your local range, most of the time will have good classes that they can teach you. So don't just go out there, get a gun and think that that's the end of it. If you don't know how to use it, then it's about as useless as you having a brick in your pocket. Oh, you yeah, know? like a screen door on a submarine, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, no, I, I agree 100% because you you have to know how to wield whatever weapon it is. Um, you know, I took baton uh, training classes, and to use a baton, uh, it's you could hit somebody with it and not do much damage. And uh, if if you're or or inflict pain if you're hitting them in the wrong areas or using it the wrong way. Um, and so there are you know there is a craft you know that you have to learn for that weapon. And uh, so you definitely need to get trained. And even if you go get the gun and go to rent, go to the range, rent a lane. And then uh, there's a gun, there's a gun, you know, trainer there. Well, range the weapons, off. yeah, the range officer. So, so they're sitting there like watching you to make sure that you're, you're safe, that the people on the range are safe. And if you go up in there and ask them a couple of questions, they'd be more than happy to instruct you on how to behave at the gun range, how to be safe with your weapon, give you uh, all kinds of tips and tricks. Um, the reason I know that is I have messed up at the range and had my gun pointed uh, any direction except downrange. And I've had the uh, <laughs> the guy come over and say, what are you doing? I'm like, what? You know, and I'm like taking my earphones off. Like, What's going on? What's the problem? You know, what are you doing? That, that you know, is that gun hot? Is it live? What's going on? And I'm like, what are you talking? What are these terms? You know what I'm saying? And he's like, OK, let me explain it to you, you know, and so. Um, the gun needs to always be pointed down range. And there's just a lot of things that you, you don't even, wouldn't even think about. Uh, real quick, I think maybe this, this bears repeating. Maybe we should go over real quick the universal rules of gun safety, right? Which, because uh, so if you are thinking about getting a weapon or if you do have one, we want to always treat every firearm as if it's loaded, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, you never want to point a gun at anything you're not willing to destroy. So you want to have the gun pointed in the direction of least consequence is the way that I like to put it. Um, you always want to keep your finger off the trigger until you're ready to fire. And you want to know your target and also what's behind it, you know. So start with those four things whenever you start handling a weapon. And I would suggest that you look that up, print it out, put it in front of you, memorize it. Um because until you've covered that, right, then then a gun can be a dangerous, you know, a dangerous thing. It's not as if they're they're toys, you know. And we're and we're not taking this issue lightly. No, but- you're right. It's it's a huge responsibility, huge. And you know what? In my uh, concealed handgun class that I took, and I was already carrying a weapon as an as an officer. And so, but during this class, they said if you if you pull that gun, you better be prepared to use it from the concealed position. 
And he said, but, you know, you may beat the rap, okay, but you won't beat the ride. So the rap is the, the charge, right? Um, you may be charged for murder because there might not have been a cop around that saw it and there's a dead guy on the, on the ground, you know? So you're going to get arrested. You're going to go to jail. They're going to process you. They're probably going to charge you. And they're going to put you in a cell. And you'll probably have to get bonded out and get an attorney and go through all of this, right? But yep. if it's, if it's going to save your life, okay, that's the most important thing. Or save your family's life. So um, there's some insurance out there, some other things you can do to cover yourself. But we're trying to give you the basics here. Because not only do we believe it's our biblical responsibility to take care of our families and ourselves, but um, it's fixing to be really important as these times get even worse. You know, food mm-hmm. shortages. Um, this is called Rapture Prep Podcast. We're preparing for the worst. And uh, the evil comes in all shapes and sizes. And so someone will kill you over your wallet or your purse. And one day it may be over just the food that you have. So, uh, but yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Well, so I mean, I think that's. Uh, I don't know how much further you want to you want to go with things. I think we've get we've laid down a good uh, a good primer discussion, right? To just kind of talk <laughs> that's, about. That's a good way to put it. Um, there's so much, uh, so much more we can go in depth over, and um, and we will. But we wanted to get this episode out to you uh, to be short and sweet. And so that way you would understand what the Bible says about weapons. Um, what what we're telling you as a citizen should be your responsibility with your with, as a weapon. And, you know, and if you're considering a, a job in law enforcement or military or any of those things, like you're a hero. And uh, we want to encourage that. So... Don't let someone yep. um, dissuade you from doing that. And um, so, yeah, it's it's just extremely important to, to do those things. But be careful. Pretend like the gun is always loaded. Yes. And do not, I repeat, do not um, give anyone else access to that weapon. If anyone can possibly get around that weapon, it needs to be in a safe and needs to be locked up. You don't just leave that laying around. There yeah, I would no say, way. I would say real, real quick. Uh, I, you know, I carry, um, and I carry with one in the chamber, but one thing I do is whenever it goes, when, when the gun comes off of me and goes into the safe where it goes wherever. Oh, wait, right? you just don't, you just don't throw it in, on the floor. You have a safe. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's pretty responsible. So when the gun comes off of me, though, and it goes into a safe or anything like that, then I have the gun in, you know, uh, basically Israeli carry at that point, right? When it's no longer on me and somebody else could somehow get to it, then I at least have, I'll have the magazine in, I'll have it loaded, but I have it at least where you have to rack the slide at that point to shoot it. Because what I don't want to happen is somebody else gets to it and goes, oh, how cool, and they pull the trigger, right? So Yeah, and, and when he's talking about with Israeli carry, um, you you can either have the gun hot, which is loaded, at one in the chamber at all times, or you can have just the magazine inserted into the gun, but there's not a round in the chamber. That means it has to be racked back first in order to load the gun. So that's where that's where I like to keep it when I'm just carrying the gun, but... Like, we'll just get into this real quick, but at church, I'm on the the team that carries guns, and we protect the people at the service. We have radios, we're highly trained, we are very efficient with communication and positioning and all these things to put uh, down a a shooter quickly. So, um, if you're going to go to church and you have a weapon and you, you feel like you need to carry, go ask the pastor about it. Go see if they have a team there. If they don't, establish the team. And if they don't want you on the team and they say, hey, we got enough and please don't carry, then you need to respect that and know that they got your back. But because um, you can wind up being a second shooter. OK, so this is uh, this is pretty serious. And I just found this out not too long ago. So they asked me, the pastor asked me to be on the team. And so now I'm on the team. So uh, just something to think about. I know um, in other public situations, 
we talk about awareness, but, you know, be aware, you know, like if you're going to pull your gun out, like, is that person uh, the shooter or are they a victim? You know, so there's a lot that we're going to cover in future episodes, but for you to think about, don't just think, oh yeah, I'm just going to go get a gun and not, uh, not know anything about it, not know how to use it, not know how to store it. You know what I'm saying? All these things are super important. So, Mm -hmm. uh, well, did you have anything to, to add on that? I think the only thing that I want to add here is the thing that we, that we always want to end with, which is, you know, all of these things, these preparations that we make, um, whether it's preparing from a food standpoint or uh, storing ammo or carrying a gun or doing these things or whatever it is, all these things are important, but all these things only pertain to this life, right? And this life is temporary. Very temporary. Uh, the, the thing that you want to make your, your biggest preparation that you, that you need to make and the best weapon that you can carry is the armor of God, right? And so the way that you want to put that on is, the, you know, first of all, by if you don't have a relationship with Jesus as your Lord and Savior, uh, you know, and you haven't repented of your sins and put your faith in him, then we want I want to encourage you to do that. I want to encourage you to seek the Lord while he may be found and to yes. place place your faith, uh, you know, in the Lord Jesus and uh you know, it's really simple. The Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That means that we're all sinners, every single one of us. And yet it said, but while we were yet sinners, while we were still messing up, while we were still out there in the world doing the things we shouldn't do, Christ died for us, right? And so all we have to do to be forgiven of our sins and all of the things that we've done and even the things that we'll do in the future is to place our trust in Jesus and acknowledge that we need him as our savior and as our Lord. And, 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 you know, that means that we'll be born again. The, the Bible says that in order to enter the kingdom of heaven, a man has to be born again. And a lot of people say, well, that sounds crazy. Does that mean I need to go back into my mother's womb? Like uh, I think it was Nicodemus that said that in the, in the new Testament. And right. Jesus was explaining, no, it was a spiritual birth. And whenever you can, if you confess with your mouth, and you'll believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and that God raised him from the dead, uh, you shall be saved. And so before we end this podcast, like we always do, what I'd like to do is just give you an opportunity to accept uh, the Lord as your Savior and, uh, you know, lead you through a simple prayer. So, uh, Paul, why don't you lead them through a quick prayer uh, to accept the Lord if they want to? Yep. And just to let you know, um, you cannot do anything to earn or deserve this. Um, if, you, if you could be a good person and that would get you into heaven, Jesus wouldn't have had to come down here and be brutally murdered on a cross and be a sacrifice for our sins. Okay. Amen. So don't, don't let the devil try to tell you, Oh, I'm a good person. Okay. So no, that's, that's not the case. The Bible says that, our righteousness is as filthy rags compared to God, that there is none righteous. No, not even one. So Jesus Christ was the one that came and he is perfect. And he wants to have a relationship with you. It's so awesome. The creator of this world wants to come and live inside of your heart and forgive you and um, have your six. He wants to, to watch your back and he wants to, to fill your life with his goodness and his presence. And it may not seem that way right now because you're so far from him, but you can feel the tug of the Holy Spirit right now. So let's just, let's just pray right now as you just surrender to him and you put, you put your guard down. And let's just pray this prayer. Say, Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father. I believe in your son, Jesus. I believe in your son, Jesus. I believe he died for me. I believe he died for me. And rose again. And rose again. I accept him right now as my Lord and Savior. I accept him right now as my Lord and Savior. Jesus, please fill my heart. Jesus, please fill my heart. Forgive me of my sins. Forgive me of my sins. I make you Lord of my life. I make you Lord of my life. Save me. Save me. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so if you prayed that prayer for the first time or 
maybe even if you felt distant from God and you're praying that prayer to rededicate yourself to the Lord, we just want to let you know, you know, you're part of the family of God. And I encourage you to go find a strong Bible believing church and a community of like-minded people and, and get in there and allow the word to, to renew your mind. You know, the, the word says that our minds are renewed through the washing of the word and we become new creatures. You know, all things are new, all things are passed away. And so, uh, and the Bible says that when one sinner repents, that all of heaven rejoices, the angels like throw a party whenever that happens. And so, uh, heaven is partying with you right now. Uh, if you just prayed that prayer and, uh, we just encourage you to, to get a Bible, get in a good Bible believing church, find a community of believers, also find a community of people who are like-minded in terms of preparation and things like that and get involved. All right. Be the good, be the difference in the world, be the source of good in this world, because the world needs more people like you um, right now at this desperate moment. Amen. And I just want to encourage you to get in the word, study it. Now, I've written a book called Breaking the Devil's Contract. It's on Amazon, Barnes and Noble. You can get it everywhere. Audio book, Kindle, all that paperback, hardback. But if you've prayed this prayer for the first time and you just made Jesus your Lord and Savior, and I want to be able to give you a a copy of that book for free. So I want you to contact me at breakingthedevilscontract at hotmail.com or rapturepreppodcast at hotmail.com. We can talk there. Just want to encourage you on your walk because that book is just uh, just awesome for uh, learning more about the the Lord and walking... um, walking in his strength and knowing more about the, uh, the word of God. So it's a book on discipleship. Really it is. And so. I want to say uh, one quick thing here. It's an awesome book. I would encourage you as far as uh, some people, when they first get to know the Lord, they say, where do I get started? Right. I've right. always encouraged people to go and start and read the book of Matthew first. I mean, you can do whatever, wherever you want, but that's the new Testament. I'll tell you the story of Jesus. And that's uh, that first great chapter place. on Matthew though. Uh, skip all the way to like, you know, the last couple of verses, because it's just going to be uh, Joseph begat this, begat this, and it'll look confusing. But um, just go down to the very end of that chapter and you'll see the story of Jesus starts there. So don't uh, don't get frustrated. Um, that's just a Jewish history trying to prove uh, the messianic lineage of Jesus Christ. So um, it's just really awesome. Just a little bit of uh, historical background there. So you don't get... Definitely take Paul up on the offer for the book. Uh, Definitely. If you prayed the prayer for the first time. If you didn't, don't, you know. All right. Yeah, so. <laughs> definitely buy the book. It's cheap. Um, yeah. But I um, wanted to do that. And I've never done that before. So I wanted to offer that out. Um, just being obedient to the Holy Spirit and... Uh, you know, so it's just going to be awesome. Now, we're going to see you next time on Rapture Prep Podcast. And, wow, we're going to be getting into some exciting stuff. So go back, listen to all the other podcasts, and we'll see you next time on Rapture Prep Podcast. Love you.